Hello and welcome to Night School. My name's Arya. And, I, and I'm Darian. Uh, and yeah, hello everybody. It's been a minute, but we are back again and we're so happy to have you here, whether you're new or whether you're regular. And regulars, y'all already know this, but we are a program of nightlife at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco which is an in-person event that happens every Thursday night and mixes together art, science, and culture in a new way every single Thursday night. <laughs> and Night School is just the online version of that. It just makes sense that for the second Night School of the year, we make our number one priority number two. Just like not the number in like an abstract mathematical sense, more like number two, the roundabout way of referring to waste or dung, scat, feces, Poop. It's night school colon number two. That was a poop joke. <laughs> this entire show is going to be, all right, it's going to be full of crap intentionally in like a very good way. And I'm so excited to hear from our three guests. Each one of them conducts research on or using poop from climate science to community led conservation work to studying poop's critical role in enabling a little insect romance. You can learn so much from poop. Who knew? <laughs> Apparently these researchers who <laughs> uh, I will introduce now, we're kicking off the night with the greatest love story ever told, the life history and courtship of the dung beetle, which as the species name suggests, revolves around poop. And research fellow uh, Dr. Sean Yap will share about the dynamic lives of these very incredible and unique beetles and the wide range of creative ways that they interact with and use poop in their day-to-day -day lives. Following that, is Ta Dr. Talia Perry joining us from Adelaide, uh, who created the community science project Echidna CSI. And yes, poop is also involved here. The short beak echidna is both iconic and elusive, which makes it really tough to study in the wild. So Echidna CSI encourages people to collect echidna scat and send it Talia's way for investigation, which is what we'll be hearing about tonight. And finally, we have Dr. Allison Markline joining us from San Francisco to share about an animal that every single year makes a whole lot of poop. And that animal is cows. She'll be sharing about her work on dairy cow manure management and about what can be help, done to help mitigate the manure's impacts on climate change, which is a pretty big one. 
As always, tonight's program is live. So whether you're watching on YouTube, on Facebook, downstairs right now in the Academy or on Twitch, say hi. Let us know where in the world you're watching from, whether it's your first time joining us, in which case, hi, hello, we are so happy to have you here, or you're a night school regular, in which case, hi, hello, we're so happy to have you here. <laughs> um, we'll have a Q&A after each speaker, so put any questions that come up in the comments or in the chat. And with that, we'll pass it on to Dr. Sean Yap. Hello, can you see and hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yep. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean, and today I'll be talking about dung beetles, about dung beetle reproduction, and about how poop plays an important role in all of that. And first, I would like to start by thanking the Academy for having me and you for being here. So a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I am an insect researcher. I work both in the field as well as in a molecular lab. And I study both insect evolution as well as insect ecology. Uh, in particular, I have a fondness for beetles, uh, the most diverse group of animals on the planet. And uh, for my PhD, I did uh, my research on the reproductive evolution of dung beetles, this one specific group. I did this together with the National University of Singapore. Uh, so to give you a quick introduction to what reproductive evolution entails, uh, often when we talk about evolution, we hear this phrase called survival of the fittest. Uh, this usually is used in reference to natural selection and individual survival of adapted individuals. However, the biological definition of fitness involves both individual survival and reproduction. So you not only have to live long enough to reach maturation, you actually have to successfully acquire a mate and have offspring. So evolution is heavily driven by both natural selection and sexual selection. And so in reproductive evolution, we look a lot at sexual selection. And uh, this is one dichotomy that we can use to look at sexual selection. So intrasexual selection is, uh, includes examples where competition happens between members of the same sex, for example, in male beetles fighting over access to female. And in intersexual selection, uh, we have non-random mate choice, uh, usually involves males uh, trying to impress females, right? Uh, this is not only through morphological traits, you can see this in behavior as well. And in humans, sometimes we see uh, ourselves, you know, either putting on makeup or putting on cologne. Uh, usually, in many cases, it's for our own sake, but in many cases as well, it's to try and attract and appeal to a potential mate. So coming back to animals, uh, these sexually um, selected traits tend to be one of the most uh, rapidly evolving traits among all the animals, plants, and fungi because they are involved with the act of reproduction itself, which is where the boundary of speciation occurs. So why have I chosen dung beetles uh, as my model, and what are they in the first place? So the dung beetles belong to the scarab family. This includes the rhinoceros beetles, uh, the june bugs, and all those uh, beetles. And most of them actually belong to the subfamily scarabaeinae. And they are relatively unique among the insects in, uh, by the fact that they are coprophages or coprophages which is a fancy word for saying that they eat poop. Uh, this applies to both the larvae and the adults. And they play many important roles in maintaining healthy ecosystems through these functions. So they are important decomposers. Uh, the rollers in particular are good for seed dispersal. And we often now use them as indicators of forest disturbance. So they mainly carry out these functions through dung removal. And this can happen through main, three main mechanisms. Uh, we have the rollers, the tunnelers, and the dwellers. So I'll be focusing a little bit more on the rollers and the tunnelers. So for the rollers, these are the most famous examples of the dung beetles that we usually see in documentaries. So this is an individual from Singapore that was rolling across the road. Uh, what happens with this group is that males will actually carve a dung ball out of a main dung pad. And the first dung ball that he creates is actually a nuptial gift that he will offer to females. So if a female comes along and decides that his dung ball is satisfactory, she'll cling onto it, or in some cases actually help him move it far away from um, the, where the main dung pad is, so there's fewer competition, and then they will mate and then use the dung for uh, reproduction. So sometimes lazy males, instead of carving out a dung ball, they'll actually go after other males that have already made their dung ball, and then uh, basically steal the dung ball from them. So that's an alternative mating strategy if you're too lazy to make your own. For the tunnelers, 
these guys do not move the dung away from the dung pad. They actually bury the dung directly where it is uh, in little burrows. And this group is the most diverse among all the dung beetles. We see a wide variety of different horn shapes and sizes in this group. And this is because for this group, instead of um, mate choice where the female chooses a male with a nice dung ball, instead males fight each other over access to females and to guard the burrow entrances. And so in this case, uh, the competition between males drives a wide diversity of horn uh, morphology. Many of these are sexually dimorphic species. So these are some examples of uh, species that we find in Singapore. Not all of them have horns, but a few that do have very nice, intricate horns. So sexual size dimorphism um, refers to the phenomenon where one sex is larger than the other. For most insects, uh, the females tend to be larger, but in rare cases, males can be larger. So for in dung beetles case, for example, uh, the, the competition between males can be so strong that it drives for uh, it selects for larger male body size, and a larger male body size will better help a male win competitions and therefore uh, be successful in mating. And this selection can be so strong that uh, the males end up being larger than the females. So this group, the Tunnelers, also uh, contains some of the largest species of dung beetles that we know of, including Helicopris tyrannus over here. And yes, that's my hand for scale with my manure manicure. Uh, so as you can see, it's about the length of my finger. Um, so how do we study dung beetles, right? The first step is to collect them in the field. And we do this using baited pitfall traps. So here's a quick step-by-step -step guide to how we set those up. First, we have to put on our protective equipment, very important. And then we gather our materials. We pack them into a nice little uh, cloth mesh, wrap them up very nicely, tie them with a nice little knot and a dumpling. And then we put them out, hang them from a rain cover suspended over a cup that's filled with water. So the dung beetles are attracted to the smell of the dung in the mesh. They walk towards the cup and they fall in. Uh, the wings get wet and they can't fly out. So we come back in about 24 hours and uh, collect the dung beetles from there. Yep, so that's how we collect them. So I don't do my field work alone. Uh, a lot of my field work was done together with my undergraduate students uh, who all happen to be girls. So a lot of people assume that for this kind of field work and especially to get your hands dirty, you know, it's a, it's a very boy, men's job kind of thing. But uh, these girls were not afraid. They were very brave. One of the job hazards that comes with working with dung is that you get desensitized to it and you develop a kind of like a crappy sense of humor. So this is an example of one of the forest types you work in. This is a primary rainforest on the island of Langkawi. So here you can see that the canopy is very tall and the undergrowth is relatively sparse. So these are good characteristics of a primary rainforest. And getting into some of these places can be very challenging. So for one of our field sites in Sarawak, we actually had to use a longboat uh, with the help of the locals. And in the dry season, uh, because the river, the water level in the rivers can be very, very low, uh, we might have to manually step out of the boat to move the equipment across. Okay, so this is an abandoned inn next to one of our field sites, uh, which happened to be pretty fortunate for us because uh, sometimes when we're processing our samples in the field, it's difficult to find a space to do so comfortably. Here, we were able to scavenge for abandoned furniture, tables, uh, to kind of make a makeshift lab in the field. And uh, one of my mo most memorable experiences was the fact that uh, I think I had the runs at this point in time, but I was not able to poop in the field because that would uh, interfere with the results of our dung beetle collection. So I had to go in one of the toilets in this haunted hotel. Yeah, um, the flush wasn't working. I'd give it zero stars. No wonder they shut down. So once you've collected the dung beetles, what can we do with all that uh, data, right? So we can answer many questions. An example of one of these questions is whether or not dung beetle communities differ between the ground level and the canopy strata. So we know that uh, there are wide diversity of mammals in Southeast Asia, and uh, many of them are almost fully arboreal. We have monkeys and squirrels that almost never come to the ground. And of course, uh, they do their business in the trees, and some of this poop doesn't make it all the way to the ground. So then is there an unexploited niche in the canopy that some dung beetles would exploit? And if there are, are there special morphological adaptations that these canopy dung beetles have to deal with this situation? So to do this, uh, we pair our ground pitfall traps together with our boreal traps that we suspend from the trees, like so. And what we found, okay, this is a very fancy looking diagram, but the main takeaway is that 
yes, there are significant differences between the communities of dung beetles we find in the canopy versus the ones we find on the ground. Um, so this is driven mainly by one species, Ontophagus deliensis. So this is an arboreal specialist. Uh, this one species uh, was found almost entirely in the canopy and almost never on the ground, right? So uh, what the community level difference means is that the types of species you find in the two different uh, places are different and the abundance of these species are also different. So along with that, we also measured uh, some of these traits from the arboreal dung beetles compared to the ones on the ground. And what we found was that uh, these arboreal dung beetles, the ones that live in the trees, are smaller in body size and they had a larger wing to body ratio. So this allows them to fly more easily, uh, fly better. They had a greater exposed eye ratio. So the, the fact that they spend less time tunneling in the ground also means that uh, protecting their eyes is less of a priority. They can have more of their eye exposed to have better three-dimensional vision when they're flying. And they also had longer legs, which helped them manipulate dung in a three-dimensional environment. So now that we've looked at uh, different species of dung beetles in a vertical space, how about populations of the same dung beetle across a horizontal space? So these are some of our field sites in Peninsular Malaysia. Uh, the big landmass in the middle is mainland Peninsular Malaysia, but we also did studies on Langkawi Island and on Singapore, which is also an island, even though it's a country by itself. Uh, in this case, we studied one specific species, Ontophagus babirusa, and based on uh, prior measurements we made in males of this species, we know that um, there's a strong sexual selection in this species, and males are likely to compete very uh, quite a bit, quite a bit. Okay, so what are the main differences between the mainland and the island? Apart from land size, uh, one of the main differences is the types of mammals that we find in these places. So in the island populations, uh, the dung that they consume mainly comes from things like wild pigs, uh, monkeys, as well as uh, the largest herbivore that we have in the islands are the samba deer. However, on mainland Malaysia, you have much uh, more diversity of mammals and a much higher abundance of uh, dung biomass. So we have things like the sun bear, which is a large omnivore, and we have much larger herbivores such as uh, the elephants. We also have the only large carnivore in the area, which is the Malayan tiger. So Peninsula Malaysia is one of the last strongholds for this species. And uh, one of our field sites in Malaysia, for example, was situated right next to an elephant crossing. So what we found from this study was that uh, on mainland Peninsula Malaysia, the males and females were relatively equal in size. There was no sexual size dimorphism. However, if you look at the island populations, we found that the males in these populations were significantly larger than the females. And the females were much smaller than those found on the mainland. So what's happening? Are the females on the islands shrinking? So what we think is actually um, a different case. What we find is that uh, most likely because of the scarcity of resources found on the island for the island populations, uh, this limits the maximum body size that they can reach. So by default, both males and females in the island populations should be smaller than those found on the mainland. However, because resource is scarcer in the islands, competition between males over monopoly of such a resource is much more intense. So in the mainland, uh, you get less competition between males and they don't have to fight as much. Whereas in the islands, they fight so much that body size plays such a huge role in the competition, it drives for larger body size. And the end result is that uh, the males that we have in the islands are so large that they reach the same size as those found on the mainland. So to better understand how poop plays a role in driving all this development, uh, we tried raising some of them in the lab and we successfully established a uh, culture. So how dung beetle reproduction works is that uh, male and female dung beetles, adult dung beetles will create brood balls which are basically small balls of dung, and in each of these balls, they will insert one egg, uh, which will hatch into a larva as such. Uh, the larvae basically feed on the dung that is provided to them, and that's all that they have, all the resources that they have in order to develop into an adult. They cannot forage on their own. So this is a pupa, and this is an adult. So for adult insects, they do not grow any larger, no matter what they eat, that is the maximum body size they reach, because they no longer molt. Unlike crustaceans like crabs, they can continue molting and growing. This means that the adult phenotype uh, is entirely dependent on the resources that they got as a larva. So uh, we raised a few generations and we put virgin males and virgin females together. 
And then we gave them an option of uh, omnivore dung as well as herbivore dung. We know they prefer omnivore dung based on the field surveys that we do. And what we found was that uh, our preliminary results show that omnivore dung resulted in larger offspring, whereas herbivore dung resulted in smaller offspring. So this shows that parental provisioning de determines offspring quality and the type of dung and the amount of dung that the adults give the offspring are very, very important. So very quickly, why should we care about this? So dung beetles are important for biomonitoring because of their close association with mammals. Uh, now, with our more recent sequencing techniques, you can sequence their gut DNA and using that environmental DNA found in their gut, we can infer what mammals are in the same area as them. And once we've gotten an established database of which dung beetles prefer which mammal poop, we can associate the host and the dung beetle. And then when we survey the dung beetles, we can get a good inference of uh, mammal diversity. And then very quickly in agriculture, uh, cattle were introduced, for example, to Australia in uh, the 1700s with settlers. They have a lot of cow dung. Cow dung looks like that, but uh, the native mammal dung looks very different. So the native dung beetle species only specialize on the native mammal dung, and they don't go for the cattle dung. So that led to a lot of pest problems because the, uh, the dung remained on top of the surface of the world, earth. And so in 1965, they brought in dung beetles to deal with this issue. They removed the dung, reduced pest populations by 90%, while also helping uh, the pests just grow better. Yeah. So I'm sure uh, Talia and Alison will be able to uh, talk more about these topics later. So my final message is that dung beetles love poop and we should love dung beetles. They are important to us. And thank you. Hi, hi, Sean. Um, yeah. That last picture oh, yeah. really got a giggle out of me, so you kind of <laughs> kind of caught me coming out of that just now. <laughs> um, that was that was fantastic. Um, and Should oh my I gosh, stop sharing. Or... <laughs> oh, you're, yeah, you can stop sharing. You can stop sharing. You're good. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was that was great. Uh, and um, the beetle, that, the tunneling beetle that you showed was so massive, like so amazing to see the diversity of all yeah. these beetles. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, like really yeah. sizable. Good manicure too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, but yeah, I'll just get right into some of our questions that we have from the audience here and just anybody who's out there, if you have any more, like definitely keep them coming. Um, and the first one from Hollis, uh, Hollis asks, what kind of dung works best to attract these beetles, if there's any in particular? Okay. Yeah. Um... I kind of didn't include this because it's a little sensitive for some people, but uh, human dung is actually the best. So across all the studies, if you look at the studies in South Africa and South America and Southeast Asia, all of us are standardized by using human dung. So it might have something to do with the fact that we are omnivorous. We eat a lot of different types of food. Uh, our gut microbiome is very diverse. Um, it's very smelly as well. <laughs> so that attracts a lot of dung beetles. So for a good general bait, if we want to put it out there, uh yeah human dung is the best it's also the easiest to obtain yeah yeah oh and that's right you mentioned your uh your, your story about <laughs> <laughs> about needing to skip the forest, <laughs> which which also took me up behind the scenes it's, it's pretty it's pretty funny um but along those lines do you have any other particularly memorable field experiences while being out there uh trying to collect these beetles for your work um well i mean some some of the interactions with the other animals in the area are pretty interesting as well. So one thing about the pitfall traps that we use is that they are open. So anything can kind of come and disturb them. And for one of the traps, I think, uh, so one of our undergrad students, she picked up the trap and she looked inside and there was like a shrew in there eating our beetles. <laughs> so it was like uh, basically having a buffet in our trap. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. That's not great for science. So scream, huh? dropped the whole cup, and we lost that data point. But uh, it was still an interesting uh, biological observation. <laughs> yeah! Wow! Did uh, wow! Yeah, that's that's wild. Do dung beetles have a lot of predators like out out in nature? Surprisingly, actually, quite a few. So, like a lot of the, um, the mammals that live on the ground and the ground surface, they do eat dung beetles. Those that burrow into the ground to look for food, and dung beetles are actually very abundant. We don't we tend not to notice them because they are usually underground, but they can occur in like thousands. Yeah, so they are a good food source for many animals. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And and we had a question in the chat from James. Are there any dung beetles native to North America? Yeah. So dung beetles are native to most places on Earth where you find uh, vertebrate diversity exists. Yeah, so wherever there's mammals, wherever there are like larger reptiles, uh, even there are definitely dung beetles. 
Yeah. So the diversity of dung beetles varies a lot. So they are obviously most diverse in the tropics, but definitely everywhere in the world, except might maybe Antarctica, uh, you have native dung beetles. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Um, that's that's great. And how long is the typical dung beetle life cycle? Uh, it depends on the dung beetle. So like the ones we raised in the lab are relatively small. They are about this size. Not these um, ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not those. Uh, so the ones that we raised take about a month from egg to adult. Uh, so relatively fast generation times, which makes them uh, useful for studying. Yeah. The larger ones probably take close to like a year or so maybe. Mm. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And and what, can you tell us a little bit more about what a typical day in the dung beetle lab looks like for you? Uh, well, it depends on whether it's a field day or an analysis day or like a, a sample processing day. So a field day would be basically what I described earlier. Uh, afterwards, the part that I didn't show is when we go back, we actually have to sort these dung beetles, uh, which can be a massive undertaking. And we thankfully can do that now with the help of uh, DNA barcoding. So many of these species are actually cryptic, meaning that they look very similar and are difficult to tell apart, even through dissection. So using DNA, we can quickly um, sort through thousands of specimens uh, all, at, all at once. And it's relatively cheap because of uh, economies of scale. The more you sequence, the cheaper it is. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the molecular side of things. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Have you, do you ever use like museum collections in your work? Yes. So that's actually one of the most interesting uh, pieces of data that we got. So for some of these uh, regions, it's actually very difficult to get permits to go in and collect some of these beetles. Uh, and one of the solutions we had was, uh, so I visited the museum at Oxford for one of my chapters, uh, Oxford Museum of Natural History, which had the largest collection of that one group of specific dung beetle that I was looking at. Yeah, and so they had specimens from the 1800s and 1900s uh, from all over the world. And uh, we were able to get sequences from specimens as old as like in 1910. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> Um, and, uh, let me see, I'm just thinking of my next question. Um, but yeah, so, okay. So you mentioned that dung feeding is a pretty unique strategy to dung beetles, yes. but are there any other insects, um, maybe beyond beetles that do this? Oh yeah, there are loads. Uh, so there are one of the other, uh, better known groups are the dung flies, uh, also aptly named. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so dung as a resource is actually pretty interesting because, um, uh, I mean, not many other animals touch it, so it's a good resource to exploit. At the same time, the nutrients are easy to absorb because it's kind of already been processed by something else, right? <laughs> yeah. So one of the things, one of the um, species that a lot of people don't really think about when it comes to dung consumption is actually plants, right? So we have pitcher plants. Uh, not all of them eat insects. Some of them have specialized and evolved to feed on dung of animals that live inside them, right? So they what? have... They co-evolve with other insects that live inside their digestive juices and feed on the insects that fall in. And then when they poop uh, the insects out, basically they're already pre-processed and it's easier to, for the plant to absorb. Yeah. Wow. And some bats also live <laughs> inside pitcher plants and they poop inside pitcher plants. Some shrews do that too. Yeah. So it becomes like a, yeah. <laughs> it's like a whole little like, a whole little ecosystem in there going on. Wow. Yeah. That is so cool. That's really, really cool. Um, yeah. And and uh, it, I this is kind of like a just a me question, but do you have a favorite dung beetle strategy, rolling or tunneling, or um, the third one that I can't remember right now? Oh, the dwellers, the dwellers are I, I would personally I would think are the least interesting because they just sit in the dung and eat it. Uh, the tunnelers are actually pretty interesting, so I didn't touch on this earlier, but uh, kind of similar to like the lazy uh, rollers that will fight other males for the dung balls instead of making their own. There are alternative mating strategies for the tunnelers as well. Uh, so, you know, you think by logic that if large horns are a beneficial uh, trait, that most of them would have large horns. But the fact is, many of them are of the, of the tunneler dung beetles that are males are actually small and very, very tiny, and they almost look like females. So these guys, uh, we hypothesize that they do this thing called sneak mating. So while the large males are busy fighting each other, they kind of tunnel in through the side, and then they mate with the females in the harem, and then they quickly escape. And wow. uh, they're undetected by the large males because they just assume that they are probably like females. Yeah, yeah please, like, wow. Yeah, there's even the trade off. So, those with the, in some species, uh, those with the smaller horns have much larger testes size. Mm -hmm. So, they can choose to invest in either pre copulation, uh, fighting before 
uh, you acquire the mate or post copulation, meaning after you re uh, copulate, having more sperm means that most of the offspring are likely to be yours. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Cool. Um, and then my final question for you, uh, how did you first fall in love with beetles specifically? How did you end up making this a subject of your work? Uh, I mean, I've always uh, enjoyed insects since childhood. Um, and for beetles, I think it was partly this love-hate relationship I had with them. So beetles being the most diverse group of animals on the planet, uh, they're exciting because there's so much to discover. They're also frustrating because you can never finish working on them. <laughs> uh, so there's this like dichotomy that somehow like attractive to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, yeah, I love that answer. And thank you so much for um, sharing with us tonight. It was lovely to hear about all these dung beetles. Yeah. And um, yeah, this, yeah. Yeah, I definitely have like a deeper appreciation for them now. <laughs> so yeah. But uh, next we'll go ahead and kick it over to Allison to talk about dairy cow manure. Thanks, Sean. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Allison, you're set to go. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so hi, thank you so much for having me and for joining. I'm super excited to talk to you um, and be here. Um, Sean prefaced this talk a little bit, talking about the dung beetles and the dairy cow poop in Australia. And I'm going to just take it from there and talk about dairy cow poop and climate change. Um, so before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory and homelands of the Ohlone people um, in what is now known as San Francisco. A little bit of background on me, I'm motivated to study socio-environmental justice. In particular, I look at food security, climate resilience, and human health. And my projects are pretty diverse within the agricultural space. I study how we can adapt crop growing strategies capture carbon, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and improve crop nutrition. This talk, though, is just focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and in particular from dairy cows in California. So you may or may not know this already, but cows make a lot of poop. This poop emits greenhouse gases, which warms the climate. Over two and a half percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in California is from poop alone. This left figure is showing the total greenhouse gas emissions in the state. And this yellow sliver is from agriculture representing 8% of total greenhouse gas emissions in California. The right figure is looking at just that sliver, the agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. And of that 33% is from manure management. So a third of 8% is just over 2.5%. About the same amount is from cow burps. Um, it's not their farts, but it is their burps, um, which is also a lot. So for dairy farms, there's two primary greenhouse gases. There's methane and nitrous oxide. These are both really potent, more so than carbon dioxide. Methane has a warming potential of about 20%, 20 times that of carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide has a warming potential of, of about 300 times that of carbon dioxide. So that means they warm the climate 20 and 300 times more than carbon dioxide. But in general, they're present, present in a lot smaller quantities. But in dairy farms, they're pretty significant, especially methane. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about three things. First, how much poop do dairy cows make? Second, why does where a cow poop matters? And third, how can dairy cow manure be a part of a climate solution? What I'm not going to tell you that in this talk, though, is what you should or shouldn't eat or drink. It's really personal, often cultural, and there's a lot of differences that can make it a really complicated question to answer, and it has to be answered individually. So to get to that first question, how much poop does a cow make? 
For every gallon of milk that a cow makes, about three quarters of a gallon was pooped out. In one day, a dairy cow poops five gallons in total, and a human poops about 0.4 gallons. So if we think about a day, all the cows in California, there's 1.8 million of them, they poop 9 million gallons a day. And there's 40 million humans in California, and combined we poop about 18 million gallons. And those numbers are really hard to wrap your head around, I know. So I did a little calculation, and that's about 13 and a half Olympic pools of poop a day um, combined between the cows and the humans. And there's Michael Phelps um, for a nice visual of that. So what do we do with all the cow poop? For this, I'm just focusing on the cows and not the humans. Sean talked a little bit about human poop, but I'm not going to. Um, and I think in the chat, there were some questions about using dung beetles for human poop. And um, that's a great question too. So to answer this question, it really depends on where the cow is standing when she poops. In a farm, there's four main places where a cow, a dairy cow can stand. They can be in the milking parlor. They can be in the barn, which is where they often get fed. They can be in a corral or dry lot, which is basically a dirt area, or they can be in a pasture, which is a grassy area. If they're in the pasture, their poop just lands on the grass and it stays there. It's a fertilizer for the soil and it's pretty dry. It dries out and then it um, is left on the pasture. If they're in the corral or dry lot, it's often scraped into a pile, like the pile this cow is laying on top of. Um, from there, it can be applied as fertilizer to a crop field or pasture, or it can be put into the barn to be used as bedding for the cows. It's pretty soft. Um, so those two are both handled in a dry way. If they're in the milking parlor or the barn, they stand on these concrete floors and to get the poop out, they're flushed with water into an anaerobic lagoon or a digester. And an anaerobic lagoon is basically just a big pool of poop. Like this one here, this is about 14 feet deep of ca liquid cow manure that my colleague is boating on. She takes samples at different depths so we can study the different moisture content, the volatile solids, and other chemical factors in the poop at different depths in the lagoon. So once they're in the lagoon, um, they can be separated into solids and liquids, and they can be applied as fertilizer, either dried or the liquid can be applied as fertigation or fertilizer irrigation combined into a crop field or pasture. It can also be hauled off site. And the reason it's really important why we know where the cow is standing is that the greenhouse gases produced depend on where the poop goes. If the cow poops in a, and it remains dry and solid, like if they're on the dry lot or in the pasture, their poop becomes nitrous oxide. And this is the most potent of the three greenhouse gases I've mentioned, but the qu quantity is much smaller. So it's only about 6% of the total greenhouse gas emitted by the dairies. If they're on concrete, then their poop gets flushed into this lagoon and it produces methane. And here the volumes are really big. So it's a really large quantity of methane and it's almost all of that two and a half percent of California's total greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a really big problem. And one way to s reduce the emissions is to basically cover the poop with a tarp. So this is a image that shows a big black tarp under which was a lagoon. And now it's basically covered with this tarp to extract the methane. And that can be used as biogas. And the... Um, solids left behind can still be applied as fertilizer to um, crop fields or pasture. 
So how a digester works is the animals poop, their manure gets flushed into the digester just as it did with the lagoon. And then it splits off into biogas, which can be used for heat, electricity, or vehicle fuel. Or the digestate, which is the remaining solids, can be used as livestock bedding, fertilizer, or soil amendments. So a couple of years ago, I did a study looking at how much these digesters had the potential to reduce methane emissions in California. So this left figure is showing the map of the whole state, and most of the dairies are in this square in the Central Valley of California. And the middle picture here, the middle map, is showing the methane emissions before digesters. And here the darker red means there's higher emissions, and the lighter pinks are less emissions. And then this third panel is after the digesters. And what I want you to notice is that after the digesters, you see a lot less dark red and a lot more light colors showing this big reduction in emissions. And as of 2021, when I did this study, there were 100 digesters that had either been installed or planned in California. And they had the potential to reduce methane emissions in the state by 9%. So since then, there's been a lot of push for more digesters. There's a California policy to reduce methane emissions by 40% by 2030. And so we've been working really hard on this problem. As of 2023, California has 236 dairy digester projects that are capturing methane from 254 dairy farms. And if we assume that their efficiency is roughly equivalent to what I had previously studied, that's about a 25% reduction in total methane emissions of the 40% required to meet um, California policy. Oh, here we go. I already said that. So manure can also reduce the production of synthetic fertilizer. This is a really energy intensive process to con um, for nitrogen, you have a triple bonded nitrogen, that very strong bond has to be broken and that requires huge amounts of energy. So manure being used as fertilizer can reduce energy usage and also downstream impacts of inorganic fertilizers. And this figure is the same map that I showed before. And here I'm highlighting that 20% of that agricultural, 8% of total emissions is from growing crops. And a lot of that is due to fertilizer production. So the thing that I want you to take away from this talk is that there are a lot of greenhouse gases embedded in our food. And the biggest thing that an individual can do is to reduce food waste. You can buy what you need and will use. There's also tricks such as making pancakes from spoiled milk to help you reduce your food waste even further. Um, these two pictures on the left are pictures of compost. And while compost is way better than just going into a landfill, there's still a lot of really usable food that's present in there. And one third of the total food produced in the world is wasted. So that's a huge waste of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's, in my opinion, unforgivable given the hunger issues that we have in um, our planet. Another thing that you can do is choose products that have lower emissions when possible. Often these cost more, so it's not always possible for people. Um, this can be organic without those inorganic fertilizers, um, pasture-raised dairy and meat products that have less time on concrete where their poop is stored as a solid, and also supporting transitional farming, which is when they're transitioning from inorganic or conventional treatments into organic or climate smart. They're kind of on their way there, but not there enough to have the, the fancy label. Another thing is to talk to your legislator about the need for lower emission agriculture. California is a huge agricultural powerhouse, and we also have um, 
pretty good legislation overall compared to other places, but it's really important in all areas of the country and the world. Um, and then also talking to other people about the importance of climate change. There's so many people who don't know that one third of the food that we produce is wasted or that the food system has a lot of greenhouse gases embedded into it. So just sharing what you know and how important it is to you to other people can be, can make a huge impact. Um, I'd like to thank you. And if we have time, I would love to take some questions. Allison, we absolutely have time and our audience has come up with some really smart questions. Um, let's see. Just a few of them. James asks, does the lagoon ever decay into a more harmless substance? Like does poop turn into something? Um, so because we are continually flushing manure into the lagoon, then no, in practice, no. Um, but if we were to do an experiment where we were to leave the poop in the lagoon for long periods of time, such that all of the methane had been emitted, then we would be left with um, just like inert carbon. But that would be all of the methane would have to be emitted first. Mm -hmm. Besides cow poop, can poop from other livestock be managed in similar ways? Or is, are all these strategies pretty cow specific? Um. In California, these are pretty cow specific. The pasture is the primary way that like goats and sheep are managed. Dairy cows definitely have the biggest impact, um, at least in California, based on the way that they're managed. It's also really different between a cow that's used for dairy and a cow that's used for beef because dairy cows are being fed with so much food and they're producing basically six or seven gallons of milk a day. They poop twice as much as a beef cow. Um, and in California, most of the beef cows are, or many of the beef cows are on rangeland. So they have much fewer emissions overall than the dairy cows. Oh, you answered Xander's question already in the comments. He was asking about the difference between dairy cows and beef cows. Oh. Um, are there any types of crops that respond better to like cow manure fertilizer? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I know that we use manure fertilizer on like our soy and corn and also like forage crops, which are the crops that we grow to feed animals. Um, I know there's like a lot of organic for farms that use like poultry manure for things like tomatoes. I used to study that. Um, but as for specific crops, I don't know um, exactly. No worries. How That's common? A really good question. Yeah, we'll have to look into it more. How common is the use of biogas from cow poop as things like, uh, or like fuel? How how frequently does that get used? Um. Well, we have. That's a great question too. It's getting used more and more, and I think the demand for it is higher than the production at this point. And a lot of that is because we have, um, there's so many emissions with like tractors and like everything on farms. So the first place that energy goes is to the farm. And then often it's for like trucking or things like that. And as we try to get more and more sustainable, it's like a green fuel, so there's high, high demand. Oh, I'm sure. Um, these seem like really good strategies for kind of large scale dairy agriculture operations. Are there any ways that like on a smaller scale, maybe even like the individual can better manage the waste of the animals that they live with, be them like chickens in the backyard or pets? Um, great question. I know that there's a lot of smaller dairies in Northern California near where you and I live and they are mostly pasture raised. And keeping your animals on pasture grazing um, and keeping their poop dry will keep the methane emissions lower. Interesting. Um, methane production, methanogenesis, um, has to occur in the absence of oxygen, which is why 
Um, it's like from a wet environment where there's no oxygen. Mm, makes sense. Patrice asks, um, is regenerative farming helping in California today? That's a great question. I'm pretty sure that regenerative farming doesn't have an exact scientific definition. So in my opinion, I think that any effort to be more sustainable or more regenerative is beneficial. It's just hard to quantify if the definition isn't explicit like it is with like organic. Okay. And then Xander asks another great question. Will the record rain in California this year impact emissions? Like it's a lot wetter in this state right now than typical. That's a great question. Yeah, when we have the soggy soils, there's a lot more methane that's produced. So yeah, I had a um, another study that's not out yet was looking at how temperature and precipitation on a monthly, daily, and hourly time scale will affect emissions. And there it's looking at like how saturated are your soils and what does that mean for the N2O and methane produced? How hot is it when it's hotter? The, there's more microbial activity. Um, so there's higher emissions when it's warmer too. Um, and that will hopefully be coming out in the next year or so. Oh, I look forward to that. Um, yeah. And then one final question. Who are the people who are managing all this cow waste? Like, shout out to them. It seems like you'd have to have like, a pretty resilient nose. Yeah, so um, we'll shout out Deanne Meyer at UC Davis. She is our resident poop specialist. Um, she is the manure management specialist for the UC Agricultural and Natural Resources Department. And yeah, not only does she spend time boating on poop lagoons, she also spends time going out um, for a 24-hour period. She'll go to the farm and count how many cows are standing in each area of the farm every hour for 24 hours. So she basically just camps out and counts. Like, there's 900 cows in this dirt patch. There's 500 cows in this corral. There's, like this many cows in the milking parlor and this many cows in the feedlot. And she does that every hour so that we can get a sense of like time of day, seasonal changes in where the cows are standing, which has the impact on how much, where their poop goes and how much methane and N2O it produces. So she's the true hero of the story. Oh, absolutely. Like as of now, it's <laughs> so grateful for her work. Yeah, kind of it's really important these best practices. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Um, up next, last but not least, we will hear from Dr. Talia Perry. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to flick through to my slides now so hopefully you all can see those there let me know if that is a problem at all um, thanks again to Darren and Aria for inviting me to talk to you I'm going to be talking to you all about echidnas and their poop and I'm hoping by the end of this you'll be just as excited about this as I am um, before I get started um, officially I just wanted to do an acknowledgement of country so today I'm meeting on Ghana land here in Adelaide Plains um, but my research does occur across the whole of Australia, across many countries. So I extend my acknowledge, acknowledgement to those areas, to the elders past and present, and to any Indigenous peoples listening here today. I'd also like to uh, mention that any of these beautiful images that you see um, in my presentation of echidnas, unless specified otherwise, have been submitted by participants to our um, citizen science project and so again a big thank you to everyone who has been involved and to make my storytelling about echidnas much more exciting um, having beautiful images and videos to go along with it. So let's get start learning about the fascinating world of echidnas. So echidnas will typically actually only be um, solitary out in the wild apart from one time of the year and that is their breeding season which occurs between June and September each year 
And what happens in these periods of time is that we have one female here that's being uh, followed by a line of males, and these are called echidna trains. These trains can last for days up to weeks at a time until uh, the lucky male gets to um, mate with the female. And as you can see from these photos, they have a bit of fun uh, <laughs> during that period of time when they're following each other around. And so then when the two echidnas mate, the female falls pregnant and she's only pregnant for 23 days and then does something quite unusual for a mammal and that is lays an egg. So echidnas and platypuses are the only egg-laying mammals in existence now, um, and we are very lucky to have them here in Australia. Uh, as you can see, the egg is very small. It's about the size of our five-cent coin, and either ironically or unironically, um, we actually have the echidna as our image on our five-cent coin. So this baby echidna will stay inside of the egg until for just 10 days until it hatches. And this is a photo of a newly hatched echidna, a very, very rare image. Um, so very grateful for our collaborator, Dr. Peggy Reese Miller for these images. If you look at your thumbnail right now, that is the size of that newly hatched echidna, absolutely tiny. And so this echidna, which uh, baby echidnas, by the way, are called puggles. So if I use the word puggle, that's why. Um, they will hold on for dear life um, to their mother, mother's hair on their underside. Um, as you can see, they've got some pretty well-formed forelimbs here. And so they hold on to the hair. Um, the mothers basically make what's called a pseudo pouch during breeding seasons. When they fall pregnant, their mammary glands will swell up with milk. And then they sort of form a little bit of a cavity in their stomach, which acts as a pouch. So that structure isn't there all year round, just when it's when the mother is pregnant. And so these, this uh, puggle will stay inside of the pouch for about a month until it starts to look like this and it starts to develop its spines and as you can imagine that's pretty uncomfortable for mum and so she um, then puts this the new the baby echidna into what's called a nursery burrow so this is a burrow that's sort of buried um, convolutedly uh, so to avoid as many predators as possible getting at the young. And the mother will only come back once every five days to feed her young. Uh, and at that point, the echidna or the baby echidna will double in size at every feeding um, situation. So the puggle will stay inside of this nursery burrow for a few more months until it starts to look like what you and I would imagine an echidna to look like. Um, and then it's off on its own to start that cycle again. And adult echidnas will become active breeders um, as little as two years old, but up to, um, like they'll start breeding up to as late as 10 years old, depending on the animal. So even though we, uh, echidnas also um, have been, because they've been around for such a long time, um, they're the evolutionary branch of egg laying mammals split off 187 million years ago. And so they have uh, very well adapted to the Australian environment. So we can see them even in the extremes of the desert all the way to the snow. Um, but even though they technically, theoretically exist all over Australia, we actually don't really know what that means. Oh, sorry, before I move forward, <laughs> this is one of my favorite parts. Um, as well as echidnas being able to adapt into all types of parts of Australia, they actually are very good swimmers. And this is mostly because they can't deal with the heat very well, so they have to adapt and find ways to cool themselves down. So to do this, um, you'll see that they use their beak as a little bit of a snorkel and their back feet actually point backwards so that, um, and that helps them in terms of swimming and digging and things like that too. Back to what I was saying before, um, <laughs> we actually know very little about most of their populations across Australia. Um, and the and that's because they're just very difficult animals to study out in the wild. They're not something that you can easily track or trap. They're not attracted to smells or to food or to sounds. Um, and that makes them a very difficult animal to then study. The only really well studied population is down here, which is a little island called Kangaroo Island. Um, and that's just off the coast of South Australia where I am. And this has been researched from Dr. Peggy Reese Miller, who is the world leading echidna expert. She knows everything 
about these guys. And because of her work for more than 30 years um, on this particular population, this group of echidnas has now been listed as endangered. And we know that echidnas on Kangaroo Island face the same threats as echidnas across the whole of Australia, that things like um, their common roadkill, they uh, have predation by animals like cats and foxes, and habitat loss are the three major concerns for echidnas across Australia. So it's likely that echidnas in other areas are doing poorly as well, but we just don't have the data to be able to support that. So we needed to get a lot of information very, very quickly in order to do some actual long-term investigations into what echidnas are actually doing out in the wild, how they're faring, and if we can find out more information about them in, in general, which, you know, it's a pretty simple task, <laughs> you know, and to fit into a you know, four-year PhD is also um, something to consider too. So what we did was we actually called on the general public to help out with our research and we created a citizen science project called Echidna CSI. So we did this by creating a um, an app that was also called Echidna CSI and that was thanks to another PhD student at the time, Alan Stenhouse, who had some great uh, app software developing skills and so he developed the app for us in line with his PhD too. Uh, and we were asking the public to do a couple of things. Firstly was to take photos of echidnas out in the wild. And so because this is through a dedicated app, we could take the date, the time, the location, which is really important in terms of um, data quality assurance um, and having the photograph with it to make sure that someone is actually submitting a echidna sighting as well. Uh, and people could submit previous photos that they had stored on their um, smartphones if they had that sort of data embedded with them too. Um, but more, I guess, unique and exciting um, was that we also asked people to collect echidna poo for us. Um, this was a bit of, I guess, a risk at the time. We didn't really know how people were going to react to us asking them to pick up some animal poo and send it to us, um, especially at such a large geographic scale, like we're literally asking people across the whole of Australia to um, participate. So to our delight, uh, Echidna CSI did really take off. Um, we've been around since late 2017, so it's been uh, five and a bit years now. Um, and we've had over 15,000 app downloads, uh, which has covered up to 14,000 new echidna sightings in those five years. And so this, these yellow dots here are the sightings that have been submitted. As you can see, we are lacking a lot of information from the centre of Australia, but that's because people don't really live there. Um, and that's something that you have to take into consideration when running a citizen science project is that we need the people to be in the locations to then give us the data. So it's not to say that echidnas aren't actually living in these areas, but we just haven't been able to reach the communities that live there to be able to get them to participate in the project yet. That's something that we're working towards. But also there's, I think, 1% of the entire Australian population that live in this part of Australia anyway. So um, it's always going to be a very difficult part um, of the country to get data on. But we were absolutely ecstatic to get even this amount of data. And to put this into perspective, um, the national database where all of this data is also going into, um, called the Atlas of Living Australia, this has about 30,000 total uh, verified sightings of echidnas that have dated over the past 100 years. So the fact that we've been able to get 50% of that in five years is great. And we're hoping that this will continue on into the future so that we can actually make some really good inferences about how their uh, populations are changing through time. Um, but most excitedly was that people really got on board with collecting echidna poo for us. So um, this was this is a map um, of the scats that have been submitted uh, to the project so far. So we've had about 800 of them. And again, very similar to the sightings, we're getting much more from the edges of Australia, but there are some incredible locations moving up um, north of South Australia to li literally the smack bank centre center of Australia, which is really, really cool. Um, and you even see the scats that are from the centre of Australian desert areas um, uh, the colour of the desert, which is which is just so cool. So to identify an echidna scat, because that's obviously something that we needed to teach people, luckily 
they're quite unique. So echidna poo sort of looks like a tube of soil. Um, and that's because as echidnas are foraging for their food, they're sucking up a lot of soil as well. And so that um, makes up the majority of their scat. Uh, and they are quite a lot bigger than I think people would assume for an animal that's sort of the size of a basketball. And they can be the size of the our Australian five cent coin. So like a coin that's about this, this big, um, even up to the size of like a 20 cent coin about that big. So pretty large in diameter. Um, and they also can be about 10 to 15 centimetres long. So also quite large um, in terms of lengthwise as well. And you'll often see them scattered with insect exoskeletons throughout the scats too, which makes them look a little bit like, oh, this sounds like this, um, a little bit like their glitter under the light. Also a pretty good selling point for people. Um, so when uh, we've been asking people to collect echidna scats and they've brought them to our lab, it's a really good reason why we've asked, been asking people to do this. Um, and that's because there's a lot of really interesting molecules inside of any animal scats. Um, so you can get the DNA from the echidnas themselves, but you can also get the DNA from the food that they've been eating and also the bacteria inside of their guts, which means that we can look at um, indicators of health and also more about their diet too. So to do this, uh, I work in this enclosed hood area. I spray everything down with a lot of bleach because we don't want ourselves to be contaminating our samples or anything in the outside world to be contaminating our samples. So bleach is covering everything. Uh, and then I use liquid nitrogen to uh, grind up the scats. So this is so that the samples will be kept as um, intact as possible, so as cold as possible to preserve the DNA, but also by crushing it up with liquid nitrogen, you're sort of bursting open the cells and releasing the DNA from these. And then that just gets scooped up into a tube that's full of some solution that really draws out the DNA into the sample. And then we purify that solution so that it comes out as a nice, clean, clear um, sample just full of DNA. And from that, we're able to sequence the DNA inside of it and learn more about the communities of DNA that's inside of those echidna samples. So one of the biggest studies that we did with um, these samples was in collaboration with the Echidna CSI project, people giving us the scats, but also two major zoos in Australia, one of them being Perth Zoo here on the West Coast and one of them being Taronga Zoo here in Sydney on the East Coast. So we've taken samples, um, as many of the wild samples as we could from across the geographic area. So these are the red dots. Um, and we tried to get them even through different climate regions. So in the centre of Australia, we've got desert areas and it sort of goes out to grasslands, subtropical, tropical up in the north, and then a lot of temperate areas around the southern parts of Australia. Uh, and we classified them as just having a basic insect diet. Um, we didn't actually know exactly what those echidnas had been eating um, at that point, but in general, we had classified echidnas diet as insect. Uh, we also were looking at the different types of diets that had been fed across the, the different zoos. So in Perth Zoo, they had been eating them as feeding them a traditional meat diet, um, whereas in Taronga Zoo, they were testing a few different types of diets. And there was a really good reason for this. Um, echidnas in captivity had pretty poor gut health for a while. So they had things like diarrhea and gastritis and they were thought that maybe the diet that they were feeding them wasn't healthy for them. So they were trying out different types of diet. But essentially this is what echidna diet looks like in captivity. You can imagine that they can't really feed them like millions of insects every single day. So they make them this slurry that's meat-based because insects eating animals are classified as carnivores. So then the closest thing that they can give them is then some sort of meat. So it's like a um, beef mince or kangaroo mince that's like mixed up with some fiber and some eggs and some other things. Um, and then they just give them this as their diet. So we were interested to find out what was happening in terms of their gut microbiome to figure out if there was any more indications on why echidnas were unhealthy in the captive populations and also just what's going on in the wild populations because we'd never discussed, we'd never investigated this before. Um, and so to do, oops, sorry, to, 
what we found was that echidnas um, actually ended up looking like they ate a lot more plant material than had been previously recognised. So we had always thought, echidnas had always been um, classified as a mermacophagous animal, so animals that eat a 90% ant or termite diet. And we discovered that that wasn't true. Um, there certainly are some individual echidnas that will munch on an echidna, an ant or termite mound, um, and that particular echidna might have a 90% ant and termite diet, but that wasn't true for across the board. From previous studies, we'd already sort of recognised that they'd been eating beetles, some insect larva or soft-bodied insects, and potentially even some fungi. But from the gut microbiome was telling us that they're actually eating a lot of plant material. And we found that out because there was a lot of bacteria that were in their guts that were breaking down plant material so that they could use that for energy sources. And that wasn't just in the wild echidnas, that was also in the captive echidnas who were only being fed this weird meat diet. So it's unlikely that this plant type bacteria was coming from only the diet itself. Um, it looks like it's been an evolutionary adaptation for echidnas and the ones in captivity haven't um, adjusted their gut microbiome fully towards a meat only diet. So we're now working more with Taronga Zoo in particular um, to continue adjusting their diets and seeing how we can get echidnas to be as healthy as possible in uh, captivity, but also um, seeing if we can get them to the point of being as close to the wild echidnas so that if there's any point where we need to translocate them back into the wild, hopefully can do that in a healthy way um, and not a shock uh, back to their system again. So another example of how we've been using the scats and the DNA and um, all of this really cool information to find out more about echidnas is actually we, with the um, uh, the bushfires in Australia, so they, the major bushfires that happened across Australia in 2019, 2020, um, in the yellow, that's where they had um, gone through and the red dots behind it are all of the sightings that Echidna CSI had um, submitted. So we can see that there's a massive overlay of where the bushfires had run through and um, where the echidnas had been living. So it likely had impacted all of their populations. As you can see here, this is where Kangaroo Island is, that population I was talking about earlier who had already been listed as endangered. Um, there was a fire that went through, a couple of fires that went through um, that island that wiped out about 50% of that island. Um, and we were fortunate enough to have some samples that have been sent in prior to the bushfires. And we had some samples that have been, that we aimed to get collected after the fires to then see if we could see any differences between those samples. And to describe a little bit about um, how echidnas actually fare in bushfires, because they're quite unique animals in doing this. Um, this is a, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, images that have been created by Anatomica Science to uh, describe this. And so essentially when echidnas um, sense a fire coming, they actually dig underground um, and they can survive fires by fires going, moving across them and then being safe underground. So they go through like a sleeping state, like torpor. Sometimes echidnas don't actually um, dig deep enough. And so sometimes then the fire can go across them and then they can get some of their spines burned. Um, but luckily, a lot of these echidnas can still survive these fires um, and regrow their spines over time. It takes a very, very long time, but um, they they can fare very, very well in bushfires. And this um, skit, this sketch um, was actually created because one of the photos that we have been submitted, not the major fires, but a different fire was actually because of this echidna here. And as you can see, there's these major burn marks going across the top of the echidna that had been trapped in um, uh, as a controlled burn site had been going over it. So we knew that echidnas can survive fires quite well, and they were actually one of the first animals to be seen um, in Kangaroo Island post-fire. So this is Peggy Reese Miller. This is a collaborator that I've been talking about previously. Um, so she uh, had been going out and surveying the, the echidnas on Kangaroo Island after the fires. Um, and between her and a few other volunteers, we managed to get some echidna scats after the fires. So these are the locations um, of the scats that we were able to collect. So the green ones here are two locations 
that had been collected before the fires, and we had three samples from both of those. And the orange samples are the ones that have been collected after the fires. And this area here is the burn site um, of the islands after those 2019 and 2020 bushfires. So we had a couple of samples that were actually within the fire area and then a couple few that were outside of it but nearby and then one that was a little bit further away. And when we looked at the uh, gut microbiome samples um, from the scat samples of these animals, um, we found that they actually had two very different gut microbiomes versus before the fires and after the fires. So that's what these two um, circles are representing. So typically, um, with these graphs, the further apart the samples are, the more different they are, and the closer together, the more similar they are. So we saw that pretty much all of the before the fire samples were clustering together, except for this guy down here, and this was actually this sample here. So what we were seeing was actually all of these samples looked almost identical, and it sort of looks like the echidnas that had been, you know, defecating in these areas had actually must have been... Um, foraging in these areas. So they were going back and forth between inside burnt areas and outside of burnt areas. And then they had a genetic microbi microbiome signature that looked like these guys. Whereas this echidna here was obviously too far away from the fires. It wasn't going back and forth between these areas um, and wasn't adapting that same uh, microbiome. So that looked exactly the same as the previous samples. So again, this is really, it's all very new information, but super interesting for us um, and gives us more understanding of what something like a bushfire can do in terms of dramatically changing the way that an animal eats and functions um, and potentially even its survival. So we're hopefully going to be tracking these echidnas further into the future and seeing if it does have any long term adverse effects or whether their gut microbiomes can switch back as the environment switches back. So before I finish up, um, I just want to <laughs> uh, show you one of my favorite videos that people have sent in. So as well as beautiful photos, um, there are some videos that people email to us as well. This is one of my favorites to finish on. Um, I have um, been guaranteed that this echidna was playing and it wasn't harmed. Um, this is just something that echidnas like to do because they're little fun animals. Um, but essentially we had a, a participant email us saying, they put out these buckets of water for their wildlife quite often in their backyard. They'd even laid flat buckets down um, so that the echidnas could like drink out of those, but they kept on choosing um, to do this instead. So enjoy. <laughs> it's poor little legs. <laughs> So um, this person had captured this echidna doing this on several occasions, and no matter what they tried to do, um, turns out it's having a really fun time. So thank you so much for listening to me. Um, you can continue to follow along with the project if you'd like. Um, we haven't been super active over social media for the past year or so, just because we're sort of transitioning between um, people being involved in the project and uh, time restraints. Um, and the app itself isn't available to submit data anymore, but we do have projects on iNaturalist and BioCollect, which is our Australians, um, Atlas of Living Australia's uh, tool for um, submitting data. So if you are in Australia or happen to come here and you want to submit to the project, you can do so through both of those platforms. Um, feel free to reach out to me. But anything else you'd like to know about echidnas um, or just the chat? Thank you so much. Hi, Talia. Um, that was amazing. My smile was so big after uh, watching that last echidna video with his little, his little legs, his little feet. Um, <laughs> That's <so much> my favorite. <laughs> seriously, wow. Um, so, okay, we have we have quite a few questions uh, from our audience that I want to get through. But first, um, I'm sorry, you just have to say more about glitter poop and like more about why. <laughs> why that's a thing <laughs> it's basically just because like if an echidna is eating an ant or a termite or something with an exoskeleton um because it can't digest that completely it just sort of digests parts of it so then the majority of that insect is still left in the scat and so because they look pretty and shiny it sort of just looks like little broken up pieces of glitter that have been all like neatly scattered throughout the scat and yeah it it, it does look really, really cool under light. I really like suggest anyone to be able to look at it. 
<laughs> yeah, I bet that looks wild under like a UV light too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, and okay, so kind of a general question. In Australia, are, are folks as wildly in love with echidnas as like I clearly am after this presentation? Or like, was it a very kind of conscious effort to um, do outreach and get people engaged in this project? I feel like it was a bit of both. I think ev like even I growing up in Australia and knowing that these animals existed had no idea how incredible and how weird and unusual they were until I started studying them and reading them. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe like we just weren't ever taught this sort of stuff. And I guess a lot of it comes down to like people just didn't know for a long time, right? But even just things about like their feet being like pointed backwards or the fact that they can swim really well or um, I don't know, just the, the fact that they're like the, one of the oldest living uh, mammals still alive, that sort of stuff was sort of just, I guess, like brushed over. It wasn't ever such a highlight. Um, but I find any time I talk to people, like just getting a few like sprinkling of facts about echidnas just hooks people in immediately. Um, and there are some like diehard people who were like super, super passionate about them. Um, but yeah, talking to the public has been such a highlight of doing the research because yeah, just seeing other people's excitement in the research is really, really nice and something that I don't think a lot of researchers get to enjoy that much. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Where did you where did you start when you were like getting the word out about this project initially? Um, so we started with media coverage. Um, a really funny story was, so our university had created a, a, like a media um, release thing that you sort of, they send out to the major sort of TV networks and media stations and things. So we had organized to have um, an interview with a couple of the major TV networks um, at the zoo that's just across the road from our university. And there's one echidna there. Um, he doesn't live in his own little part of the zoo. He actually like lives in where the, the birds are for some reason. So he's at a bird sanctuary and his name is Stevie um, because he's a blind echidna. And so they named him after Stevie Wonder. And <laughs> we had done the interviews and we'd been there for at least an hour, if not longer. And they couldn't find the echidna in that exhibit anywhere like none of the zoo staff could find it we were like looking for him everywhere couldn't find it like this is something that's probably maybe 10 meters by 10 meters it's not a huge area and so we were like yep this is a really good like like start to the project being like we you know <laughs> we're trying to like learn more about echidnas but we can't and we need the public help because clearly we can't even find it when we know one's in here how are we like a bunch of like you know 10 researchers meant to find out where echidnas are across the whole of australia so um yeah it, <laughs> so luckily the news stations had previous footage of echidnas that they could use as like a backdrop um that was a very funny way to start it. So we got the, yeah, the initial news out through that sort of thing. And then, you know, every now and again, sort of news stations would get in contact every time they sort of heard about the project. And so we had, I've done quite a lot of like radio interviews and like small TV things. Um, but a lot of it was social media as well. So we had like set up the Facebook account initially and then set up Twitter and Instagram. And I guess those sorts of networks um, was how a lot of this had gotten out to the just, the wider public mm -hmm. yeah no that's great <laughs> that's that's a really great story like clearly they're like, <laughs> that elusive <laughs> like, <laughs> it's really good um yeah and uh you know uh you mentioned like echidnas during their breeding season do they do they like hang out in packs otherwise are they pretty solitary like what yeah they they're pretty much solitary for the rest the rest of the year so um, and also not all echidnas participate in breeding season every year too. So sometimes it's just like a some of them that um, are ready to breed. A lot of the females will only breed like once every couple of years anyway. Um, so it's very rare to see these trains, which is also such a cool thing that when we keep getting like photo and video footage of these trains across Australia is super interesting because previously there had been maybe like two or three researchers who had really seen them in the wild before and recorded like long term how long these like trains were lasting for or how many echidnas were a part of them so the fact that we can capture that information on top of just where they are and what they're doing um, is really really cool 
Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we have Cheryl in the in the comments with a question. How do echidnas um how do echidnas figure in Aboriginal history and traditions? And were any Aboriginal people consulted or collaborated with on this on this project? Yeah, so that's something that we're trying to look into more now. So I'm now post-PhD funded by a um, centre of excellence called um, the uh, Australian, um, sorry, I've just like, <laughs> Australian Biodiversity and Heritage. Um, and so that group has a lot of connections, like the whole part, um, a big part of the centre of excellence um, is about engaging with Indigenous groups um, and making sure that we're consulting them before doing a lot of the research too. So that's something that I'm starting to do now, um, but wasn't something that was on my radar five years ago, um, which I think is just a, a almost a time snap in how like much Australia's even recognition of involving Indigenous people in research and especially with the ecological research has changed quite a bit over the past few years so it's something that I'm really excited to learn more about but I don't currently have the information mm -hmm. no really really cool that that you've seen it, the landscape change and in involving indigenous people broadly though like yeah that's cool that's really cool it's still um, a very long way to go still a very long way to go but it's, it's <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> absolutely um and then just one final question um how did you, you mentioned briefly, like you, you know, you learned a lot about echidnas as time or when you started researching them first, but like, how did you end up in echidna research? Oh God. Um, I guess it was a bit of like a luck sort of situation. So I had, I'd always really loved animals in particular mammals since I was very, very little and always sort of had thought of the idea of being like a zoologist, even though I didn't even know what that really meant at the time of being like in school and stuff. But um, once I got into university, I was doing quite a broad range of subjects, um, including the, the environmental ones, but then I really fell in love with genetics as I was studying it. So I sort of had just always tried to find ways of combining genetics and animals together, which is pretty like niche because a lot of genetics is very human based. So there were only sort of a few labs in our university that were doing that. So I'd done my honours degree, which is something that you do pre-PhD in Australia, with a different group who, um, where I sort of learnt more about using these genomic techniques. Um, but they were studying things that had already gone extinct, um, so ancient DNA type stuff, which was very cool, but I much rather like study things that they're still living and that we can stop from becoming extinct and do more of the conservation side of things. So that's where my idea was for going into a PhD. Um, and my current supervisor, um, whose name is Frank Grutzner, he had done some lectures about doing his whole research is about platypus and echidna uh, genomics, but he hadn't really done much in this like environmental conservation space before. So I sort of just approached him and was like, hey, I'm interested in your research, but in a bit of a different way. And he was like, great, I'm really interested in exploring that area and we haven't done much of that yet too. So like, let's just do it. So it was sort of a, a bit of a collaboration of both of our parts of like, I wanna do this and I wanna do this. And so we sort of just like made it work. Um, yeah, and that's sort of how it happened. So sort of fell into echidnas in particular accidentally, but now that I'm with them, there's just no going back. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Like, again, the bucket. Like, just... <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing your work with us and um, for being here tonight. It was a pleasure. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Great. And then I'll bring you. Hello. Sorry, I cut you off. Uh, well, I was going to say, bring Darian back on, and there you are, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> but thank you so much um, to Sean, to Allison, and to Talia for three really, really amazing presentations about the wondrous world of poop. It's, um, they were amazing. <laughs> we here at Night School are live the third Thursday of every month, which means that we will be back next on April 20th, bringing you all of natural science's coolest researchers, creators, innovators, our next program, we're going to get a little deep. We're going to dig right into the earth, into tree trunks, into diatomaceous deep sea sediment. We're going to go straight to the core. 
like we're going to be talking about like literal cores, those layered cylinders that we can use to help learn about our past and present and like plan for the future. Heard of them? <laughs> Please join us on April 20th. <laughs> Please join us on April 20th for a program which is absolutely fitting of the coolness of its title. Night School Hardcore. Hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, subscribe to the California Academy of Sciences YouTube channel um, to know to be alerted when we come back with that episode. We're also streaming to Twitch and Facebook. Hey, hey. Um, and yeah, you'll you'll be notified every time night school is in session. And all of these episodes do stay on our YouTube forever. Um, so feel free to rewatch old episodes at any time. Send them to anyone anywhere on Earth. And yeah, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you again. Good night.